Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nightmare Podcast. This is episode 86. I am Christy, and I am joined by Brian. Hello. We have a very special guest, a Las Vegas local, Tom Devlin is here. Hey. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. I oh, really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. This yeah. is awesome. Yes, I love it. You have a lot of projects and a lot of things to talk yes. about, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot going on, Tom. It's been a big year. It's crazy. There's even more. I mean, it's, it is nuts, yeah. It's, but that's good, though. Staying busy is good, though. Yeah. So you had a premiere last night for your movie, Las Vegas Frankenstein. I did. We had a premiere over at the Palms Casino in the Brendan Theater, and it was fantastic. It was a... Uh, that theater's beautiful. I've never been in there before. Uh, the house was packed. I think we sold out every seat in the first screen, where, which was our cast and crew and general admission all together. And uh, it was amazing, man. It That's was awesome. awesome. The, uh, my producer, Mike Lanzini, he's, uh, he runs the Sin City Horror Fest, but he also runs a thing called V Horror, and he produced the movie, and he put this all together. And it was just, it was awesome to have like a night of horror in the middle of August or what, what month are we in? July. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was 113 degrees out, but we get in there and it was just like, I don't know. It felt like a spooky season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I was like, they added a second theater. Was that something like they call you like, hey, do you want our screen for it? There or? was overflow. So we sold out the first screen. Uh, they saw it selling out. So they, they added the other screen and uh, that was super helpful too. Um, it was one of those things where like i wish everybody could fit in the same room because uh, the experience in in the the premiere room to me was a uh, um much greater because every the energy in that room was awesome oh uh, uh, yeah definitely yeah. yeah um but your latest project that you've also done too was teddy told me to teddy told me to uh sitting right here so this is a very rare copy of teddy told me to this is our, <laughs> our this is our tour only we only ever made a hundred of these blu-rays and uh and they sold out by now so uh this is cool this is very cool it's funny because it was only a year ago or so even less that we had these but i feel like this is an, an artifact like yeah. uh what it was like halloween right? uh we're doing exactly. right now what's called the pre-release. We're calling it the pre-release. So we have an, a different cover, and it's the same discs. But then um, coming up here in mid-September, we'll put out the official release. It'll have uh, special features and hopefully a slip cover, and um, it'll be a much more packed Blu-ray and DVD. But this is a uh, very cool to see. You guys were at the first <laughs> screening yes. of mm -hmm. Teddy. Yes. Um, I will announce it here first. Nobody's ever heard this, but Teddy will. Uh, come out nationwide uh, streaming on VOD on October 10th. Awesome. So it, is a, it is moving forward with an official release and we will have Blu-rays. Uh, we will eventually, I'm a merch guy so I will have vinyl soundtracks and VHS tapes and all yes. the shirts all the and goods. everything. But, uh, but we are uh, very, very proud of Teddy. Uh, this was our first movie that we did, that I directed and we made in-house uh, here in uh, Nevada so uh, as a whole I mean I work on movies here in Nevada but this is uh, Plan 10 Pictures which is me my wife and a couple others as a collaboration it's a great collaboration yeah. I watched it again mm -hmm. yesterday and it's it's so much fun <laughs> it really is and I love seeing your <laughs> your haunted house which you do um, in the movie as well yeah do you want to tell people about we your shot haunted house we shot this whole movie on location uh, at the Fright Zone, which is next door to the Monster Museum. Um, we do a haunt every October in the Monster Museum and at the Fright Zone, and it's uh, a ton of fun. Um, and we actually made most of this movie during haunt season. So we would run the haunted house, that's a wrap, and then we'd get our actors in and we would shoot at night uh, from like 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. and uh, shoot out the haunt set. So it, it was all there, it was all ready for us. We tear it down every year and rebuild, and we've built so many movie sets in there now. I think this year we're gonna focus our haunt more in the Monster Museum and not use that building, because that building has become just movie sets and props, and so there's so much crap. It's almost <laughs> it's almost a storage room. It's like now. a little warehouse. But, uh, <laughs> but the uh, the Monster Museum itself, we, we call it the Nightmare at the Museum, is an awesome haunted attraction here in Vegas, and people yes, it love is. it. So. Yes, I love your museum. And you're always changing it up yeah. all the time. Constantly changing. Which I is mean, great. 
we have uh, we have to cater to the locals, so we want it to be fun and exciting every time they come back. But also, there's tourists that come to Vegas every year, yes. and mm -hmm. we need them to come back to the Monster Museum every year and see what's new and what's changed and what's been added. And uh, it, it's it's awesome. We just put a big predator in there. I'm real proud of like that guy's awesome. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, we were just there a few we weeks ago just, for your it, it feels like signing. every time we go, we're going in through a different door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It does feel that way, that yeah. there's a different door all the time. <laughs> I'm not going to jinx it. Knock on something. This might be the last entrance door. Uh, okay. <laughs> we just never dialed the entrance door. And there's so many times before you guys were here, before you've ever visited, I used to have a, uh, like a ticket booth with a Crypt Keeper in it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And when you bought your, uh, paid your admission, we hit a little secret button and the Crypt Keeper would talk. Oh, and he would oh. tell you the rules. Take, don't take pictures, blah, 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 blah. Or you can take pictures, no flash. All this, blah, blah, blah. And when he was done with his bit, the door would just... And it would open. Oh, cool. And it was so cool. But if more than five people were in line, and another group, another group, another group. They all had to wait through each time because that door was on a timer. Oh. So uh. it was a, uh, it backed up the whole museum. So we had to tear that out, and then we made a new door. And we, we've changed the entrance probably nine times. <laughs> and I think right now, in the new facade, the new way that it is, it's going to stay the entrance. Okay. Yeah. We <laughs> we were battling with the fire department pretty hardcore for the last four months, and this morning oh, no. we <laughs> triumphed. And they, Yay! they passed us, and they're not going to lock our doors up. Yay! And, uh, we relit the entire museum with these micro cool little LEDs, and uh, the fire department wasn't wrong. We were breaking code, and uh, we had to adhere to what safety standards yeah. are. So we're there. We're safe. Well, tell us a little more about the museum as, as far as, you know, like what made you get it started, um, you know, and tell about your hours of operation and all that too. So for those of you who don't know, Tom Devlin's Monster Museum is, um, it's a year round attraction, a roadside attraction. It, it It's in Boulder City, which is right outside of Las Vegas, mm -hmm. on their way to the Hoover Dam. It's it's about 18 minutes from Nightmare Toys. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, people hear Boulder City and they think it's another world. It really is less than a day trip uh, off the Strip. Yeah. If you want to just go up, have lunch, go to the Monster Museum and come back to, to the Strip, it's within that time frame. Um, my mission at the Monster Museum is to preserve the art and history of practical makeup effects. I've been a makeup effects artist for 24 years now. Uh, I've worked on 163 films and I have watched what we do slip away to a digital world. And when I first got in the industry in like 99, 2000, I remember calling the Kyoto Brothers, the guys that made Critters and uh, they, they uh, directed and created the killer clowns from outer space batteries not included they're incredible effects artists mm -hmm. and i called them and i said i'd love to love to love to come work for you i'll sweep your floors i'll do whatever back then we had yellow pages we didn't have really any other wet, no instagram <laughs> right? or anything so i called them and i talked to charlie kyoto and he's like absolutely not kid like go back to pennsylvania go to college get a real job the computers oh. are taking over uh, there is no makeup effects career for you. And I was heartbroken. And it was crazy because they had just done a movie called Pinata with Nicholas Brennan when this happened. I I'm almost positive this was around that time. And they covered over the, they made a very cool creature suit, little person creature suit. And it got completely covered over with CGI. And they were disheartened. They were pissed off. So, but they told me that that was the first phone call I really got through to an effects artist. And it was somebody I admired and, uh, and and I was just like, no, man, I, this isn't going to disappear, whatever. So I um, I did I continued my path, ended up working at a place called WM Creations and, and did makeup effects for years. Ten years after that, I ended up working with Charlie Kyoto and I told him, I said, hey, man, you told me to pack it up and go home when I was 18. <laughs> and I didn't. And here we are working on the same movie. It was this cool little thing called Night of the Little Dead. Bill Mosley was in it. Uh, Penn from Penn and Teller was in it. Oh, and, wow, uh, cool. And he goes, I never said that. I wouldn't have told you that. <laughs> and I was like, no, you did. And he's like, no, no, no. It must have been my brother. I was like, it wasn't. It was you, you know. But <laughs> it, was, it was just this amazing moment of like, I've never been one to ever not do what I want to do. Right. But so the Monster Museum, I, I'll be honest, Charlie wasn't completely wrong. 
because the computer elements have really seeped into our industry and it is a tool and it is an art form i did this really low budget movie called bio slime that i am so proud of and um i made director john lachago me john carius we're just like making this movie in a hot apartment and it was so awesome and we made creature suits as cool as we could but then john added these digital effects where like the girl sticks her tongue out and it gets real long and purple and she swipes the slime off her face and those little hints really amplify it. John also directed Killjoy Goes to Hell. Um, mm -hmm. And and we shot that movie in a room the size of this podcast room. <laughs> and he extended all those sets digitally. And it looks beautiful. It looks like we're in a world. And um, it's just one of those things where like digital is definitely a helpful tool. It's a helpful thing. I use visual effects in my movies. But when you make a creature from from start to finish, on the computer it then looks like to me a cartoon i never play video i'm not a gamer like i don't play halo or <laughs> doom or what i don't even know what the one <laughs> you know but uh there are there's a whole generation of people mm -hmm. that when they check out of work they go home and they get on their uh, warcraft or whatever it is right and they play all night their brains are ingrained with that's their entertainment is this cartoony weird creature that's not quite anatomically moving right or physical enough to touch and so when they watch something like the avengers and there's a real digital character it doesn't skew them like it does me because i don't play those games i'm not immersed in that world and it just looks like roger rabbit to me it looks like a cartoon with humans and i don't really understand why i uh one of my biggest gripes is Gollum in the Lord of the Rings movies like yeah what a freaking practical effects dream of a movie and they did so well and then they have this cartoon character standing next to them that could have been done with practical effects but then you have somebody like Guillermo del Toro who does a uh, Pan's Labyrinth and blends the two so beautifully but to not rant too much the museum is designed to educate and preserve that art of of creating something with your hands using clay and rubber to make monsters and uh you know what jack pierce did and john chambers did and, and lon cheney senior stuff that and end up through modern day you know the k and b guys mm -hmm. and uh john beekler my favorite effects artist of all time like yeah. i love rubber monsters and and i want to share the art of rubber monsters because a lot of people i'll never forget i was on a movie called zombies and mass destruction it was one of those eight films to die for we were in seattle mm -hmm. And this guy, Colin, he was just a camera guy. He just asked me, he goes, hey, who's your favorite sculpture? sculptor? And I said, oh, man, maybe John Vulich? And he's like, "What's John? who's John Vulich? And I said, he sculpted Castle Freak. And he was like, no, like, like you're like a sculptor. And I was like, no, nah. he, he wasn't understanding that makeup effects are sculpted with clay the way art is sculpted with clay. Right. And I my mind was blown because I was like, I don't know sculptors that aren't makeup effects guys or mask guys, you know? Uh, so it was really a weird epiphany. Like, Oh, there's art outside of this, but these people don't know that this is art. Cause I live in this, right. you know, I live yeah. making art all the time. So I don't know. That's what the museum's all about. We're open 10 to six every day of the year. And, uh, except for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. If, there's ever a time that we we do special events sometimes and stay open late or sometimes i'll get uh you know i won't do it for anybody but like if somebody from la or somebody i've worked with in the past shows up and they're like oh man i'd love to see the museum but i just don't have time i'm like show up when you can i'll open the doors i just want to share it you yeah. know yeah oh but, i love uh, that I, yeah. I i love that whole story you just told i love your whole explanation on the practical effects yeah. and the digital i totally agree with you and the i love the crazy thing is is just, recently i and i don't mean to cut you off no you're fine i got hired to be involved with the texas chainsaw massacre video game yeah which and that was huge that i never i don't know anything about video games i didn't know anything i don't about, either so i didn't know anything <laughs> about gun entertainment I didn't know about the Friday the 13th game. Like, I knew there was a game. I remember a Nintendo game. But I don't know. <laughs> I had no idea the um, secrecy and the NDAs and the... I mean, we worked on this move, this game for two and a half years, and nobody was allowed to ever know. And it was incredible. But the whole time we were doing it... I wasn't doing it. There's no effects because it's a video game. I was there uh, as a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 
representative of the classics, I guess. Like, I don't know how to really explain it. Kind of an authenticity coach. Uh, I was there with Kane to make sure that Kane kind of stayed Gunnar Hansen and didn't slip into scary ass Jason, which he oh. is naturally by trait. And I, you know, keep your shoulders down. And, you know, there was a director, Ronnie Hobbs. He knows what he's doing. But I was like Kane's security blanket, you know, like yeah. making sure that my eyes are on his twitching, his shoulders, his uh, posturing. I did make him a little fat belly to wear so he felt like Gunner, and um, uh, it was an amazing experience, but I watched my future disappear. I, I <sighs> wa While Kane performed in the middle of an empty room and Scout, uh, Taylor Compton, and Sean Whalen and all these horror icons in front of me on the monitors, it's the hitchhiker, it's Leatherface, it's uh, the cook, and and I'm like, we're watching the monitors in real time. So when I'm watching Kane to make sure he looks good, I'm looking at the apron on the monitor to make sure it's flowing correctly. It wasn't just him in a motion capture suit. He's already Leatherface. And I'm watching that going, they don't need effects artists. Like, who needs an effects artist? <laughs> we can just draw the monster and have some guy run around, and then you don't have application times that take four hours, removal times, allergies, eating problems. Like, those <laughs> shoots with Leatherface were amazing because... We would just go swing a chainsaw around, kill a bunch of people, eat lunch, get back to it, go home. It was like, I'm not even tired. I don't <laughs> even know what to do. <laughs> so I want, and, and this is just the technology today in 2023. Right. Like in 2033, they don't need me. You know, <laughs> that's, it's pretty insane how, and the cool, weirdest thing, not the coolest thing, because I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of Terminators. I'm afraid of AI. I'm afraid of all this. We were planning a game two and a half years ago before technology existed. So it's like, well, for the plat how the platforms will be, we're gonna wanna shoot it like this so people have the freedom to do this because right. they mm -hmm. learned so much on that Friday the 13th game. And if you bring it up, I've heard this from people. They're like, oh, the glitches and this or that. Dude, these are guys paving a road that doesn't exist. So they learned so much on Friday the 13th that we incorporated into Chainsaw, that like the game's gonna get released, but there's so much more that will come after it. It's so How exciting. And it's and it is very true to the canon original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's not this isn't like made up weird stuff. This is they had Kim Hankel involved who's who's approving every step they took. It was pretty That's good to know. It That's was awesome. Pretty awesome. Are you going to play, even though you say you don't play games, but since you were involved, are you going to try to play it anyway? So I told myself I would. I don't want to sit. My kids have a Switch. I don't know if it'll be on that. But uh, I watched some of the YouTube videos of, like, people playing, and I just don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a gamer. You're like me. I'm not I'm either. not a gamer. <laughs> I can watch Chud on VHS. Yeah. Rewind it and watch it again. Yeah. Three times in a row. Yeah. But I can't stare at a video game for 30 seconds. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, there's a loss. And it's that digital thing to me. Like, I love Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes is probably more special to me than most 40-year-olds. Uh, Planet of the Apes kind of sits well with a 60-year-old. But, but for me, Planet of the Apes was so special. And the advancements in makeup effects, we wouldn't have Freddy Krueger, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Hellboy, none of this without Planet of the Apes because John Chambers changed foam latex forever. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, making those apes emote. Uh, but you watch those new ones with James Franco, and I love those movies. Um, they're really entertaining. I don't remember them. I can't draw Caesar or Bright Eyes. I don't know what they look like. If somebody's cosplaying one of them, I don't know who it is. It doesn't resonate in my brain like Dr. Zaius and Zira and right. Cornelius mm -hmm. and Aldo and all of those apes I know from my childhood that are physical. I could draw them, I could sculpt them, I can I can pick an action figure off the wall that's out of the package. But if you had the modern Planet of the Apes, I don't know you the difference no between yeah. any of them. There's war paint, but I don't even remember what direction or where. And there's some loss in that digital media that doesn't land in my brain the way uh, something tangible does. And I don't know. That's I'm the same way. No, I, I feel like I'm the same way. you don't know how to go way. about it. Yeah. Because it's yeah. all uh, motion capture. Yeah. So it's like, well, how, how you yeah. don't know the texture. Just not the, a, it, they just don't, they feel more like a dream than like a, the, than like a dude in a suit. You know right. what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a weird thing.
It's very weird to me. Well, let me ask you this. So what was your very first thing that you ever sculpted? Like your very first thing that you made? The very first thing. Oh, I have a picture too. I could send it to you. I don't know oh, if, you, yeah. if you guys put pictures up or anything. It's terrible. I made <laughs> a leather. It was a leather face mask. Oh, first, cool. First okay. thing I ever made. Well, the first piece of art that I ever made that I thought, this is freaking cool. I can make stuff. Uh, was a Power Ranger mug. I made a mug in art class, and it was a Power Ranger mug. And it was like, got the Ranger logo on it and two red Ranger hands holding the handle. And it's stupid. <laughs> but uh, my dad still has it. He keeps pennies in it or something. That's but uh, but the first monster thing I ever made when I was like, I'm going to be an effects artist. I was probably 13 or 14, and I sculpted a leather face mask. And it's it's terrible. Do you still have it? I don't. It wouldn't. Okay. I, I have a photo of it, but I don't have the actual mask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no idea where that was. And I I just kept at it. So there's there's several types of artists. I'm going to segue a little here. Sorry. There's there's people that are naturally born artistic. Mm -hmm. and, and those people are awesome. They come out of the womb. They can sculpt. They can paint. They can, they do, can this, do whatever. They can do that. Yeah. There's people like me. I'm a, I'm a trained artist. I have extreme high appreciation for art. But I am not a naturally gifted artist. I've never been a naturally gifted artist. I've worked very, very hard at perfecting that Leatherface sculpture to the point now that I I could sculpt Leatherface with my eyes closed. Because I didn't stop because it was crappy. I just kept doing another one and another one and another one. Part two, one, part three, one. Uh, you know, over and over and over until I became good at it. And I learned from really great people. But uh, it's... It's the determination to be the best that, that really makes me keep trying. And I still, every time, I just sculpted uh, for Kane because he did um, the video game. Mm -hmm. They couldn't use the mask for motion capture, but they uh, he wanted to have it for the visitation, visual uh, aid to see what Gunner saw. Because you can't see, it's not like having clear vision. It's, you know, a little in front of your face. So he just wanted it on set as a tool to feel correctly. So I made him a killer mask and a pretty lady mask. For the um, for the game, and they're beautiful. And I, I think about it, I'm like that first sculpture of Leatherface was terrible, <laughs> and this is beautiful. So I got I got better. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that um, practice makes perfect. I think anybody. I get so many people are like, oh, I love what you do, but I'm not an artist. I can't. I can't. And I'm like, ooh, that's a challenge because if you can write the word eyeball, spell it correctly, which I probably can't. A Y E B A L L, whatever. Uh, and then I could hand that to you and you could read it and say, eyeball. That's that's putting art into a communicative fashion. Like I, I made shapes and communicated with you what I was writing. If you can learn to write eyeball, you can learn to draw an eyeball. You just yeah. have to learn iris and the pupil and the, you know, little veins and whatever. And then you can look at it and say, oh, that's an eyeball. It, it, we're taught to write when we're very young, but they stop teaching us like, you start saying that you're not an artist or you can't draw when you're in like third or fourth grade and that's a horrible thing. Yeah. Because anybody can draw. You just have to be told, no, a nose has a shape like this, just like a J has a shape like that. You know? It, it, you are so correct. It can, you can yep. learn anything. If you can learn to speak French, you can learn to freaking sculpt a monster. You know? Uh, I, I did it for some years, still can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have much of an artistic ability, but I did do arts and crafts and all that too in school and everything. My sister was very artistic. Like Naturally. she was, she, yes, she and was that's born a crazy and she can thing. draw and paint any, like she was amazing. My brother, natural gifted artist, doesn't create art. <laughs> but it's like. See, isn't that crazy? <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that drove me. I was like, I want to be as good as him. And I never was. And probably still, maybe not. But I don't ever test the waters. Like, one time about 10 years ago, I asked him to sculpt a mask for me. And I was like, God, it took me years to get as good as that. You know, but. And he just sculpted just, something. Is this, is this okay? It's a scarecrow. It was beautiful. <laughs> um, but it was a, uh, it's just one of those things. Some people are born with it. My partner, yeah. Waleed, you guys know him really well. Yeah, of course incredible artist like to the point that like it makes him lazy because he doesn't have to try as hard so he's a yeah, super procrastinator and and stuff but when he does when he puts it down whether it's a painting a sculpture whatever he's doing it's just like ah, that's awesome but the interesting thing is we have a very similar style but i've worked so hard to get there yeah you know? i don't know 
Art's crazy. Art's a it weird thing. It is crazy. <laughs> yeah, I can't draw or do anything. Like you could. You just haven't I, tried. Well, I mean, well, it would I did t- an it art takes, class, but what it you takes were saying, an immense amount of trying. Yes. Like I don't mean like oh you have to try for an afternoon. I mean like. I sculpt a monster a week for 20 years, like to yeah. make sure that I'm the best at what I do or I can catch up with the Justin Mabrys and the those <laughs> guys. And I, it took me years, me and Justin have talked extensively about this. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, he runs the art side of Trick or Treat Studios, Studios yes. uh, Night mm-hmm. Owl Effects. He is a, a massive knowledge of, of uh, effects artists mm-hmm. and style and he locks it in his brain like a robot. And uh, you might be a robot, but we've <laughs> we've talked extensively about like who's what pieces look like, what styles, and who who are we robbing for this? And I tend to take my um, my stuff from John Carl Beekler and Gabe Bartalos a lot. Those are two of my favorite effects artists. And a lot of people think it's like an easy out. Like those guys are low budget guys. Those guys might they're not the Rick Bakers and Steve Wangs of the world, mm. but. I resonate with these rubber monsters they with leprechaun with with ghoulies with the stuff they created that's what I wanted to make my whole life so I don't do it because I'm not my my goal my bar wasn't set low it was just that's my actual inspiration right and um now for the last 10 years I or eh, eight eight years I've really tried to stop replicating or pulling from anybody and now I'm just this is a Tom Devlin piece. And I've gotten so much better because of that. I love you know? that. That's great. Yeah. And now you're coming out with all your own movies mm-hmm. and everything, too. It's, it's That's a crazy You've trip. been so busy this year. Yeah. <laughs> and you've the got lots thing, more going on this year, the too. The movies thing goes back to 2007. Like, we started Plan 10 Pictures in 2007. Mm-hmm. My wife is an incredible director. She made four films. Uh, Legend of the Sand Squatch, Gould Creek, The Trek, and a movie called Halfway to Hell We Never Finished. And then... She got burnt out. Like, I am a force, and to work with me is very tough because I'm go, 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 and I don't stop at next one. And she got a little burnt out, so for 10 years we didn't do anything. And then when it came time for Teddy, I really pushed for her to direct it, and she didn't want to. And she was like, this is your story. You've wanted to do this for years. Just do it. Well, that, like, opened a floodgate I wasn't aware of, and uh, I love directing movies. I love doing makeup effects. I love building sets. I like all that. I loved, for a control freak, (laughs) <laughs> this is when That's you great, are in huh? charge of the job. whole world <laughs> and when you surround yourself with the right people like right, of great course. people great scripts great actors like we're making very small movies but with so much passion and I love it I absolutely love there's it there's tons of passion in this movie yeah. and yeah. let me say why you have a wonderful mix and group of people in this movie for you you've got family you've got your friends you've got predominant people in the horror community that we all know and you've got actors and actresses that we also mm-hmm. all know you got so many people so a mesh of people going on in this movie it's fantastic and might I say that your wife and your child did wonderful yeah. in this movie they're great your yeah. daughter I think stole the whole movie movie that's seriously i I agree agree. (laughs) she was so cute (laughs) i I love it and uh she was uh eight years old when we did it and uh, she was great my wife was so nervous when she was like how are you gonna put lily in this movie because we co-wrote it with a guy named vince Mm -hmm. and he really beefed up lily's part and lola my wife was just like that's insane like you can't make that and i was like oh i'm making it oh you and, did and, and it's she's great. great she's great she killed it she uh, did kill she did it really good is there gonna be another one maybe? i hope uh so i've been asked a lot about the sequel i wrote a, we've got a script my buddy tyler and myself collaborated on a script and um with some really cool prom- prominent horror figures hopefully uh being in it good but the thing is is i need this movie to catch on first i need them to want the sequel before i force the sequel in order for the sequel to be what it needs to be i need i need fan base i need people to demand it and then we will make it rather than just jumping into production on something and then pushing it on them right you know totally understand Um, that in october 10th october will be streaming it will be uh not all the channels are we're still making sales and deals but uh it will definitely be on Amazon. It will definitely be on, um, man, I have a whole list. I wish I'd brought Tubi it. Tubi, maybe? Tubi, it will drop down to, so it's going to do VOD first, which is okay. rentals. And for 40 to 60 days, it'll do rentals, depending on how good it's doing. And then we will drop it to ad-based revenue, which okay. will be your Tubis and 
Voodoo and Plex or whatever. Oh, cool. Um, but so, uh, so like the Amazon, probably Voodoo. Uh, is Xfinity still a thing? I we don't know. we got on um, uh, Google TV. We got on uh, man. There's a whole bunch. There's this a uh, New Village Video, which is like an online rental store, which oh. is really cool. It feels like a video store atmosphere online. It's a website oh. called New Village Video. I haven't heard of that. So we're just going through the process. Um, right now of solidifying the the VODs our fingers are crossed for direct TV and um, dish network which is puts you in every hotel in North America which is it's funny because that's it comes out in October you're stuck in a hotel you get to watch a Halloween movie yeah. like that's pretty cool it's a perfect time so, for it to come out yeah so <laughs> I mean because it's about on and out really <laughs> fought for an October release because it's a Halloween movie and I you know I worked on this really cool film called Time's Up a New Year's Eve film. It got released yesterday. Yeah. It in got July. Really yeah. Digital. In July. <laughs> it's a New Year's movie. And this is no. Like, I'm really bummed. I, I can't wait to watch it. I haven't seen it yet. And uh, awesome. we, we had a blast making that movie. But it's in the snow in in New Year's. And we're going to watch it in when it's 115 yeah. degrees out. Well, well I maybe mean, it'll I, cool I, us off if it's yeah, in the snow. <laughs> Damien said he had a lot of trouble with distribution. Yeah. So it seemed like he got that worked out. Yeah. I, I am uh, very excited to see it. That was a super... Actually, I pulled some of the cast members for uh, for Teddy out of that. Oh, you know, cool. Kamara and Topher, uh, who are our leads, were both involved with Time's Up. I love her. The yeah. Your lead actress yeah. in Teddy Tell Me. She's just too cute. Yeah. She seems like a really cool chick. She's awesome. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's out there doing her indie film thing. Good. So it's I'm glad to hear that. It she did great. Yeah. It's been a wild ride and uh I can't wait. I can't wait for this one to drop and then a couple months later we'll get another one out there and another one. I'm glad we're and doing yeah. this, you know, that way we can start talking about <laughs> I it like now, the, getting everybody excited about it now. And they're gonna yep. be like, Yeah, I can't wait for October and everybody's gonna watch I was it. I've probably watched this three times. Yeah, I've watched not, not it twice. Not including seeing it in theaters. That's I awesome. have like, watched I really it twice. love the movie. That I is, do, too. I think it's a great story, and I love everybody in it. Well, what I would like to talk about a little bit that we haven't mentioned at all Go ahead. is uh, Christy is in one of my movies. <laughs> <laughs> She's in Nameless. Yeah. It's a slasher film. Yeah. Uh, very 1970s slasher film. Uh, my wife is wrapping up the visual effects right now, and it's freaking incredible. It's, uh, it's everything that... You know, Teddy is a very 80s early 90s slasher mm -hmm. film um nameless was set up uh to be a very 70s early 80s slasher film so it's got that i don't want to say grindhousey feel because that's overused but more like that town the dreaded sundown last house on the left the gritty gritty horror. yeah it's gritty uh with a smidge of house of a thousand corpses in there at the end i mean yeah. it's i'm so proud of it and and it's one of those things where it's like uh there's some great kills there's some there's no humor really it's not funny it's not like teddy teddy is a more like sleepaway camp 2 or friday 13th part 4 this is more like the town that dreaded sundown it's not yeah. made to mm -hmm. be silly and and uh you doing a wonderful job thank you and, uh, your wife i remember telling me that my screen was really good so oh, i was very incredible. honored that she said that to me <laughs> so she's our she's also our sound designer so i'm i'm pretty sure that she removed your scream and put in a sound library that we can use uh for other stuff too oh good because oh, it was thanks. really good you oh, got a you. wonderfully bloody death <laughs> thank yes i did it was so much fun yeah and, uh, <laughs> it's very brutal and that is a movie i don't have a release date on it yet but we do hope to get it finished up and uh you know now that frankenstein's been premiered the same producers made both of those so uh v horror and hopefully we'll get a cool uh premiere for that one too i can't yeah. wait i so, can't wait for everybody to see that yeah do you want to continue like just kind of going at your own pace with the movies or if like charles bannon because you have done a lot of work for full moon if he asked you hey do you want to do this would you do it i i would 100 percent uh be a gun for hire for the right people um if it was charlie yeah of course uh i i credit charlie for so much of my career but also i am a child he's my childhood hero you know and after I cut together the Frankenstein, Las Vegas Frankenstein trailer, I texted it to him and I said, I didn't realize until I was making these movies how much I learned from watching you direct, how much I learned from watching you in the director's chair, absorbing that, because I was doing effects on his movies, never thinking I was gonna direct. 
Um, Las Vegas Frankenstein is a full moon movie. I mean, it, it's got a full full moon cast. John Carius from uh, Killjoy Goes to Hell. He plays Skidmark. He's like one of the main, he is the main bad guy, basically. I like the name, Skidmark. And then uh, <laughs> we have Victoria Strange from the Ouija's and Vince Cusimano from Blade the Iron Cross. So three prominent full moon actors that, oh, wow. that starred in, a, they're mm-hmm. not just extras, they, they starred in full moon and they star in our movie. And then our sets are very old empire, early full moon, you know, foam castle sets. And um, it's an old style monster movie like Charlie Loves. And, and I actually wrote Las Vegas Frankenstein as a different movie called Dr. Death to pitch to Charlie to let me direct Dr. Death. And oh. uh, he ended up going in another direction and using Dave Parker, who's awesome. Dave Parker is one of the greatest. He did uh, Hills Run Red, which is one of my favorite movies. And, um, and The Dead Hate the Living. But Dr. Death wasn't meant to be. And then this opportunity came up three days later. This Mike Lanzini from V Horror said, hey man, do you want to direct a movie? I said, I have a script that's awesome. And I changed the puppet from Dr. Death into a collar that brings uh, Frankenstein monster to life. Because in my original script, it was a Dr. Death puppet that builds the Frankenstein monster. But it, oh. I just changed him into a, a collar. And then it's the exact same. We didn't change anything else. And uh, <laughs> so it, it is, it really was an homage to Full Moon as much as a, uh, to the 30s and 40s horror films of trying to make a modern monster movie. That's awesome. I don't know if uh, there was a movie that Charlie made called Creepies that mm-hmm. is a uh, little guy, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, Mummy, were- yeah. Wolfman. I love that movie so yeah. much. Um, and it, it, it's, it was in my mind while we were making Las Vegas Frankenstein. Oh, that's awesome. That's how many, so, so how many, or can you tell the audience, like, what are some of the full moon movies that you have worked on? Oh, Just man. some that they would know, maybe. So I'll try to rattle some off of, off the top of my head. Uh, my first full moon feature was uh, Killjoy 3, or Killjoy's Revenge, depending on if you got it from Redbox or not. Uh, we shot that in China, and it was amazing. It oh, was, wow. Pff, what a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and we revamped the Killjoy series with Killjoy 3. So Killjoy 3, 4, and 5, I did all three of those. They are, um, that's a trilogy. Uh, yeah. Like Killjoy 1 and 2 are awesome. Killjoy 3, 4, and 5 are incredible. And uh, I, I love those characters. I love John Lechago, the director. We had an amazing time. Uh, both DPs, Tom Calloway and Howard Wexler, amazing. Uh, so I did those three. I did Evil Bong 3 that Charlie directed. I did Killer Eye 2, Halloween Haunt, The Dead Hate the Living, uh, Real Evil, um, Raven Wolf Towers, Which is Puppet a fun Master one. X, Axis Rising, Puppet Master Axis Termination, Blade the Iron Cross, uh, Unlucky Charms. Don't watch that. <laughs> um, I did uh, shots for Ooga Booga with Karen Black's eyeball getting popped out. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, the last movie she ever appeared in. And I know I'm missing. There's there's some that I'm missing here. Oh, yeah, a lot of Evil Bongs and Ginger Dead Men. Ginger Dead Men versus Evil Bong, Evil Bong <laughs> 6, Evil Bong 7, which we shot at Tom Devlin's Monster Museum. Uh I love that you will bomb me. I don't. <laughs> you don't? No. No, they're so cheesy. They're I love terrible. them. They're <laughs> terrible. Uh, I, I love Evil Bong 3 because that was the first time I worked with Charles Band directly. And uh, oh, Ir- okay. Irwin Keyes, who played Mongo in uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, was one of the leads. And, and to work with him was awesome. But uh, I hate the Evil Bong <laughs> movie. And I, I'm so proud that they shot Evil Bong 7 at the Monster Museum. But couldn't they have? Shot a subspecies movie at the Monster subspecies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ouija's. I forgot Ouija's is one of my favorite Ouija. movies. Oh, Ouija's, That yeah. is one of my favorite movies I ever made for Charlie. Uh, Danny Draven directed it. I love working with Danny. Um, there's a lot of full moon stuff. Yeah. Oh, uh, so I spent a good moon. several years with them and uh, on and off for a lot, of, a long time. But I, I was a huge, huge fan. I am still. Yeah. My dining room is filled with Puppet Master toys from the 90s. Like, I love Full Moon. And uh, I tried to get in with them for years. Every convention, I give them my business card or I try. And uh, it was really funny because when Killjoy 3 happened, uh, John Lechago, the director, is like, well, I have to bring my effects guy. And he said, oh, we already have effects guy in China. And he's like, no, I have to have my effects guy. Like, he's, we work together. 
And Charlie was like, well, we already have a guy in China that's going to do the effects. He's an American. He speaks English. It's going to be fine. And he, and then he said, my effects guy can bring Trent Haga back, who played Killjoy oh. in part two. And Charlie goes, okay, you can bring your effects guy. <laughs> so, because uh, me and Trent are longtime friends from Troma, actually. And uh, and so I brought Trent on and, and then... Uh, and the rest is history. Trent said he would never play Killjoy again after part two. Oh, he shit. ended up doing three more movies. And then me and Trent got flown to Corpus Christi. Somebody hired us to do a clown wedding where I put him in Killjoy makeup. And Demon Clowns got married. The whole wedding party was in Demon Clown makeup. Oh, my gosh. And it was incredible. It was this big Demon Clown party. And Trent gave the bride away as Killjoy. <gasps> and How never broke that? Never broke character. It was amazing. That is so cool. Yeah, Killjoy is uh, real special for me. And I know, I, listen, That's awesome. I never came to Hollywood with the goal or a aspiration to work on Jurassic Park 3 or something big. I, I would have loved to work on a Nightmare on Elm Street or a Friday the 13th movie in the 80s, but not now that they're major. You know, yeah. I like small stuff. I don't know, but... Like, I wanted to work on Toxic Avenger and Pub Master. That was my goal. And to have Killjoy as my Freddy Krueger. Like, I did a franchise with this killer clown. That's ah, awesome. So, and all Everybody's my best gonna friends. Everybody's going to go out and watch all the Killjoys now. All my <laughs> best friends. Trent Haga, who plays Killjoy. Al Burke, who plays Punchy. Victoria, who plays um, Betty Boop. Ty, who plays Freak Show. John Lechago, the director. We were a group before Killjoy. We made Bioslime. We made uh, Feast of Fear. We made movies... They helped on my wife's movies. We help on their movies. We were a group before Killjoy, so we just brought our love to Full Moon and gave them some of the best product they got. You really That's do That's awesome. You will love Killjoy 3 and 4. Killjoy 5 is a circus, but it's called Psycho Circus. Right. It's supposed to be. It's zany. It's stupid. It's fun. But Killjoy 4 is not a slasher film. It's like My Cousin Vinny in Hell. Like, it is <laughs> awesome. And uh, sometimes these movies like Ouija's or Killjoy Goes to Hell... They get lost in like a B movie pile of people like, yeah. oh, yeah, they're cool. Uh, they'll buy them and they'll never watch them. Mm -hmm. But so much passion and art and time go in, and not a lot of time. We shoot them in like five days. But uh, so much goes into this little world that I anybody that can spread the word, they're so they're so good. You and know? we have some of these movies yeah. here at Nightmare yeah. Toys too. Yeah. We we sell full movies. You guys have a lot of cool movies and yep. the VHS stuff mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have some cool. VHS too. Yep. That um, so like when I first moved here, you were you had like a makeup effects class you were doing. Do you see yourself yeah. like expanding that to like a school, kind of like how Tom Savini does? No, no, no. Um, at one time. That was the whole goal. So I taught at Cinema Makeup School in LA from 2005, four to 2006. I taught at Makeup First in Chicago on and off from 2011 to 2013. And then uh, I moved to Las Vegas because I was working at a school here. Um, not gonna mention their name. Uh, they were rough. It, it was a great program. I wrote the program. I, I loved the program, but uh, there was, it was a business and I didn't feel that the students' best interests were the in the top of the priorities. So uh, I met a girl named Kayla there. She was the administrator, and she was let go uh, shortly after I was working there. And I stayed for another year or so. And then when I left, I called Kayla immediately and was like, let's open a real makeup school. So when you first got here was the beginning of that. I, we were going to give a go at making like our own makeup effects school. The problem is some of my gripes, like when we made a list of what we don't want, is I don't want a past student to go from paying to be a student to getting paid to be a teacher. That's something that's very common in all makeup schools. And it's usually somebody that's very talented, but you have to have real life experience. And I have a lot of experience both teaching and on set and, and problem solving. The whole job of makeup effects is problem solving. It's not just sculpt a monster and then go bring it to say, it's right. how do we fix this thing? Because it ain't ever going to hold up. Uh, so you have to have that real life experience and you have to teach those students what they're in for. So w with our school program that we started, we did, I think, three full classes. It's very lucrative because people, it's a college level education. I am certified to teach. Funny thing, I'm a high school dropout who teaches at a college level, but, uh, and I'm certified in the state of Nevada and, and Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, you didn't need to be. 
Um, but so the the thing is, is uh, the classes were getting bigger and it was getting I I live a crazy life and to be <laughs> there five days a week. So my students have me. It was too much commitment with everything else going on. So we segued back once we made Teddy. We made Teddy after one class, like just as a side project. Let's just make this movie real quick through October and whatever while we're in between classes. I fell in love with directing and I had a meeting with uh, Kayla and my wife and the people involved with the school and we were just, we were on our final like signature to be a, um, I forget what the word is, not accredited, but the one beneath that, that it makes you a trade school. You can take <laughs> financial aid and uh, I forget what it was, but um, I said, don't sign the paper. I know we just spent a lot of money on this application. I don't want to have a school because I cannot commit five days a week for the rest of my life to make sure they get a proper education because I don't have outsiders that'll come work that are not previous students that I need somebody that has life experience right. you know and uh, we're in Boulder City Nevada we're not in LA so I can't have guest mm. teachers just pop in and we had Robin Slonina from Skin City come do an awesome body art demo it was amazing um, and it was success that it was hard because I was sitting there with with my partners and I said, this is super lucrative and successful. And I'm about to pull the plug right now. Cause I just don't want to, I don't want to cheat anybody that's coming. You go to the Tom Savini school. Tom Savini is not your teacher. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Jerry Gurgley is, Jerry Gurgley is, and he's amazing. Or Sean Ronzio, he's amazing. Those guys have huge careers behind them. And this is the twilight of their career. They're teaching. People say, oh, if you can't do, you teach. That is not true. It, if you can share that what you've learned with someone else who's going to go there's nothing more rewarding That's i have true. students that have gone on to be major players in the effects world i got student past students that just got emmys and i think it's so cool that's awesome but i don't um here in boulder i don't plan on leaving boulder city i'm not i didn't move here to make it in hollywood but oddly enough making these little movies like this is my new plan and it's my focus. I'd like to get to the point where we can produce a movie a month, and I think we can get there. Um, we just have to dial it in. And I think we can make, you know, eight to ten movies a year and uh, and build a build our own full moon. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. There so you go. I do put the school lessons out on Blu-ray, uh, and I sell them at conventions, and I think it's great to share the art. I'm writing a book right now that uh, it's almost done, uh, like – like a how-to book, uh, giving away every brain secret I have. Well, that was a question effects. I was going to have for you, and you're now answering it. So yeah, go ahead. I, <laughs> I I get asked about books a lot. I'm making yeah. a like a textbook that was for the school. We're going to finish it as like a this is how to make monsters. You know, that's and awesome. Here's all everything I know about making monsters. Doesn't mean it's the right way or wrong way. You might find something in there that you would do differently. This is how I would teach it, and this is how I make them. And then we can share that with the anybody that cares to make practical monsters and then also you know someday i've always been working on memoirs for like 10 years of how to tell this story that i've been on this wild ride but it just keeps getting crazier so i'm not there i think i gotta be like 80. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you whatever. still got lots going on yeah so. it's, it's just going it's, i mean you uh, can probably write one book but you are probably working on a second right now too <laughs> i don't know I, I just don't think the story's done I don't know. There you go. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's crazy, you know. But I was going to ask that too about books. I was going to ask if you would do a how-to book, and you just said yeah. you, you're doing that. And I was going to ask, you know, if you would write a book about your life because I'm. You have a lot of stories. You have a lot of great I, stories. I'm sure. I have several chapters about the life stuff yeah. that I've written. Um, I'm going to need somebody to help make make that a book right because i don't even know how to read so <laughs> <laughs> i somehow made 24 years through uh doing makeup effects with i i maybe read three scripts like i don't i i have very i read at the ability of like a fourth grader i'm i'm not really very good at that at retaining or even just reading so there's a I don't know. It, th that's why this is a story that should be told. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that are told that uh, this gets really... I'll, I'll cut this off quick, but there's a lot You're of people good. told that they're disabled and disordered, but uh, 
that's bullshit. Yeah. There's a lot of superpowers hidden in plain sight. And if you can just stop listening to the officials that are telling you you're fucked up, you can move past that and be extraordinarily successful. Yes. And uh, a lot of people who are extraordinarily successful would be considered disordered or disabled. And that's fucking retarded. Yeah, I think so, too. Well, and I say it retarded. I know that's a don't say it word, but I, I am, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. That's very heartfelt. I think a lot of people will, will love that story about you, Tom. So... What you have another question for Tom? Um, Central, just what's next? Like you, you have Nameless coming out. But like, do you have something already so, ready to go that you can talk about? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. I'll talk about it all. So, uh, <laughs> Teddy told me to comes right. out October tenth. Right. Um, Las Vegas Frankenstein and Nameless are both owned by a distributor, and they're going through their own avenues of release. I don't have a release date. I know that they are guaranteed to come out because they have distribution with a reputable company. Um, but they do their own thing. You know, I, they might be bigger than what we can do. They might end up in Walmart. I don't know. Um, but, uh, when they do come out, I will announce everything. We made another movie called the after dark that stars, uh, WWE superstar Gangrel. Um, and, uh, it's amazing. Lars Fredrickson from Rancid's in it, oh, uh, cool. which is my favorite band of all time. Um, it's a punk rock vampire flick that it's like the goths versus the punk so it's almost like interview with a vampire versus lost boys oh cool and uh, it's i'm so proud of this movie uh and i just finished the rough cut three days ago and it's going into uh when my wife is finished with the visual effects of nameless she'll move into uh, the after dark doing all the fine tuning she does all the fine tuning and then um i'm going to shoot another movie at the end of August called Bloody Bluff that is a uh, Ooh, I already like the film. name uh, Sasquatch film and uh, we're going to shoot up in Mount Charleston oh, cool. and um, that is a Plan 10 picture exclusive like we're, we're building a brand here and yeah. we're going to do many movies um, I was talking to you recently mm -hmm. about uh, uh, an anthology that we're working on that is going to be shot in September hopefully and then uh, in November, I want to make a big movie about robot boxing. Like the GoBots of Real Steel. Like, oh, like the low budget, but not shitty version. Uh, really a um, kind of a throwback to like Robo Jocks and Karate Kid squished together. You oh, know? that'd be fun. So uh, a <laughs> family friendly film, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but I just have, I just want to keep going. Uh, producing these little movies and and uh, finding a home for them and building an audience and uh, we'll see what happens. That's but awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's kind of the future, I think. Of course, maintaining, running, a, and modifying the Monster Museum is always first and foremost, because the Monster Museum is our living. Um, but the movies could slowly take over. You know, uh, the cool thing about the Monster Museum it gives us the ability to make our own stuff without being a gun for hire where we have no mm -hmm. control so um you know we still have to find investors and sometimes it's my own money sometimes we find a uh investor that just really wants to be a part of the project and uh you know we have a good track record we're doing really well so uh i think that it can just build from here i feel like i don't want to compare it to new line because i would never want to grow to they grew to the academy award level and then fell apart because it, new line was a small company and it, and mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see myself in a full moon situation or an asylum situation where we're producing massive amounts of content with known characters, but I also will never forget the attention to um, entertainment and quality because I think sometimes that gets lost with content. Like yeah. Just put mm -hmm. content out, but that's really boring. Eh, we need to drop a movie, you, you know. Right. I can't stand a boring movie, so. Yeah. I think you are on your way to, to your goals there, Tom. Yeah. I hope so. I'm pretty good at hitting goals. 
<laughs> well, I know we're all excited here at Nightmare yes, Toys, and we excited. totally support you. And everybody out there, when you come to Las Vegas, you're a horror fan, you got to come to Nightmare Toys, Nightmare Cafe, go out to Boulder City, make sure you go see Tom and his Monster Museum because it's amazing. And he's always changing it all the time. Mm-hmm. And he does signings too, just like we do. So let's talk about that just for a second because you do signings and autographs. We do stuff. signings and autograph stuff. We've really. L- limited it now yeah uh, so two a year is kind of my plan um we do our anniversary party and we try to go all out for that we just right. did a really cool one with uh danielle harris and scout taylor Which we were at they did a know. live podcast yep. it was an amazing day and it shows it me that fun. limiting them is is what we need to do because yeah. i feel like we were doing one every other month or so and the attendance was dwindling and then it makes the star maybe feel like they're not as important as I want them to feel. I want the stars to feel important. I want the patrons to feel important. I want everybody to f- just have fun. Right. Um, so we do a Valentine's Day one, and we do uh, the um, we do the anniversary party in July. So now sometimes I, I'm friends with a lot of people in the industry, and if they happen to be in town, whether it be Felissa or or Daniel Roebuck or whoever it is right. and they're like oh I'm in town can I do a signing or should we get together and do this yes of course I I would never turn somebody down right but mm-hmm. dealing with the travel and the putting them up and 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 giving them that huge day not once a month anymore like yeah maybe it, just it can be twi- a lot <laughs> just, just twice a year keeps it a little bit more special uh, for us um, and I'll be honest I collect Autographs I, of all my uh, right. childhood collections, toys and movies and all that. I don't collect anything anymore, and I've sold off most of my collection. But I am an adamant autograph collector, and so when we started doing these signings, we make these banners, yes. and I have them sign the banners. Yeah, and I became obsessive, and so now I'm collecting these giant five foot by <laughs> three foot banners of people autographing you know at my location it's this cool personal thing but i got like 40 of them and i have nowhere to display the banner guess what so, we're in the same boat so we have, have the same problem the ro- <laughs> i gotta slow the roll i gotta I slow it so i don't just i need a place to put the banners yeah <laughs> uh, i'm like maybe we just plaster them on the ceiling of the monster museum I don't know what to do. That's what we're That's in the why same we started way. having them sign the bathrooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. We were doing the same thing. I like, wish I would have banners? thought at the beginning <laughs> to have them sign. I have a purple hearse. And if I would have just had them sign the hearse, I would I would be fine. Oh, that'd be fun. But the banners are, uh, I've got rolls. In, I just need to, dis- and I have. I also have this like binge and purge thing where I'm like, well, if they're not being displayed, they should be auctioned for charity. Like, what are we doing? You know, but, <laughs> but I need to display them, but I have nowhere to display them. There's so many. I was like, I could do the whole outside wall, but they'll get faded in the sun or whatever. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I slowed the autograph signings because I don't want to, I need to figure <laughs> out what to that. do with the banners. So and, uh, you do have a lot of autographs all over. Uh, yeah, in your, and in the that's store the coolest thing about the museum. All that used to be yep. in my house. I'm sure both of you guys have like, houses full of autographs, mm-hmm. but it's so fun to let people enjoy them. And I saw mm-hmm. here in Nightmare Toys, yeah. like all yeah, your we photo have ours too. Yeah, uh, it's so fun to let people enjoy them, and and people get off on it. They're like, oh my god, you met Robert Patrick, and I have a story for almost all of them. You right, know? <laughs> it's uh, so. And as you can tell, I could talk a lot. So I'll get somebody brings up Robert. Patton, I'm like, oh my god, we worked on X Files when I was 18. He was amazing. Blah, 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 blah. And we just go, go, go. And uh, that is, uh, I don't know. It's a good icebreaker having all those. Do you autographs. ever get anybody that comes in and just want to buy your autographs though? Because they do that with us all the time here. All my autographs that are like to nightmare toys. Yeah. People still want to buy them anyway. So <laughs> one time there was a pickle where I had two Jennifer Tilly autographs. One just said Jennifer Tilly, and it was a bright Chucky one. And then one said to Tommy, uh, all the best, Jennifer Tilly, blah, blah, blah. And then also Debbie, the little girl that played Tiffany, Mm -hmm. had signed it too. She's passed away now. I don't remember. She also played Pinhead in Pub Master 2. She was the hands. Um, Oh, I didn't know that. But uh, she uh, had signed it too. And my buddy Waleed was working the counter. He's like, somebody wants to buy the Jennifer Tilly autograph. I was like, really? Tell her 120 bucks. And they're like, okay. I thought he meant the one that was just signed Jennifer Tilly, not the one to oh, Tommy. Oh, oh, yeah. And he sold the, her, the one that's to Tommy. I was like, well, I hope her boyfriend's name was Tommy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, what? 
who buys an autograph with somebody else's name on it? And and Debbie was on there, and that's a sad thing because she's gone. And I was just like, that's so weird to me. They ask all because the time here. I also have a, uh, a big issue with, like, I don't want an autograph if it's not personalized. I want it made to me. Yeah, I'm so the same way. So that Jennifer Tilly one that's not made to me, uh, now I have to keep it because I don't know if I'll ever meet her again. Right. And, uh, but it's just one of those funny things. And they do, I have a Devil's Rejects poster that's signed by like the whole cast and crew. And every, once a week somebody wants to buy it. I'm like, that says to Tommy all over it. Like, I don't know who, yep. who would want to buy that. I think you know, we've even had people ask to buy my photo op pictures yeah. too yeah, just because just want the photo and it's op me pictures. and philip in the pictures with everybody <laughs> that's with weird. our nightmare toys but yeah, yeah people ask out all the time that's to buy a weird all that stuff thing. but there's a, to people that don't attend conventions and stuff right it blows their, they, it when blows they their see, mind like, yeah i have a lot of power rangers memorabilia i'm a big power ranger fan and i keep it at the museum because i just want to show it off i i like the attention that it gets right and um and there's monsters in power ranger or whatever mm -hmm. yeah but uh but people all the time like, oh, my God, you met the Green Ranger. Oh, my God, you met Serena Vincent, whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, I went to a convention and they were there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's a level of meeting someone and there's a level of waiting in line for someone. But right. uh, with the Power Ranger ones, I really did most of them meet it because I'm I can go into that world and go to those conventions and I'm just a fan and nobody I don't get recognize or or talk to or any but if i go to a horror convention oh god i, don't know, I love your yeah. museum i watched justin scarred oh i seen the carpet bagger blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> you're the guy and it's like yeah man but uh <laughs> but but at the power ranger convention you don't get that no you don't and it's that. like i can just hide in the crowd and be a fanboy again same thing in the wrestling where i love wrestling and i go to these indie shows and nobody's like you're that guy that made killjoy they're just like <laughs> They just stand there in, in a line sweaty with like, me. Who are the you know? are you? <laughs> they, don't, they don't care. And, it, right. and it's uh, it's kind of cool. It's probably a breath of fresh air for yeah. you every now and then. I love that. It can get a little overwhelming, I think, when everybody's coming up to you at horror conventions. And, and you're trying to be a fan. You right. know, a yeah. little bit. Right. You know? Right. There is a... I'm going to ruin it in the wrestling world because this movie I made with Gangrel, I plan on hitting every wrestling show and promoting that movie <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna ruin it but and wrestling and horror go together they, they go do together like well. peas and so, carrots yes man. they do <laughs> that's another thing i i don't watch wrestling but yeah <laughs> it's a uh, i used to i uh i i'm a big dope for it yeah i love so it was brian. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was brian it's all good there's a lot of us <laughs> yeah it's a uh, i don't know it's an escape from reality yeah. that uh I don't get from the movies anymore because the movies really are my career. I mm -hmm. love making them, but I don't watch a lot of modern movies. I will watch movies from pre-2010 any day of my life. Right. But I don't watch a lot of new movies. And it's not, there's nothing, no bias or anything. I just don't, I don't know. You sound like me. I'm I the dropped same off. way. <laughs> I dropped off. I, I, uh, I, but I do love making them. I love creating them, you know. So... Is there like a dream project for you or anything or like a dream movie you would have loved to have worked on or maybe work on later or anything I like that? I have an answer for both of those. Okay. So dream thing that I would have loved to work on and I, if anybody wants to help out here, just throw me a line. <laughs> uh, I'm a huge Leprechaun fan okay, and yeah. I wanted nothing more than to work on the next Leprechaun and it's in production right now and I've tried extensively. I tried to... I worked for Barry Barnholtz, the original producer. I tried to contact him, couldn't get through to him. Went to the director that I worked for with him. He's like, Barry's not gonna, he's not involved. Blah, blah. But I was just trying to find who was. And then uh, by the time I, like four or five months of digging down this rabbit hole, it got announced that it's being directed. I would have loved to direct it and do the makeup effects. But I really just want to do the makeup. I just want to be involved with Leprechaun. Right. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that I, I've done Puppet Master. I just wanted to say that I did Leprechaun. And I, di I didn't get to, um, on the last one, Leprechaun Returns, which was really good. Uh, yeah, I a like lot it. Of, a lot yeah. of people skipped it because they didn't know. No, the I Warwick think it's Davis great. Davis isn't in it, but it is a direct sequel to the mm -hmm. original. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I don't know his name, but the guy that played um, Francis in the uh, in 
Peewee. Mark the, Holt. It's his Mark, birthday today, yeah. actually. Oh, it's his birthday. I did, yes, yeah. I posted the picture of he me and him so together. Good. Yeah, and, and yeah. I love him in in the first one, and uh, I love I love Lepre- I love all the Leprechaun. I do too. Movies. I love Leprechaun um, movies. And so, I would have loved to do makeup effects on that. that that's the the franchise that got away. But if I know it's in production right now, and if anybody out there knows that director, and I was on deadline two weeks ago, and I've sent messages, and nobody will respond. Oh. I just would love to uh, to provide the effects for the Leprechaun. I don't want to just give some. I just want to be involved with Leprechaun. That's awesome. Um, but then uh, dream project for making. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to get around to it here um, next April or March. Uh, I'm a huge Edgar Rice Burroughs fan. I don't know if you guys are familiar. He did a series of books in the 1800s called Princess of Mars, early 1900s. Uh, he also created Tarzan. But um, Princess of Mars is kind of the basis for all modern day sci-fi. Star Wars, Star Trek, He-Man, all of that comes from uh, Princess of Mars. And in between the first two books, there's a 10 year gap. And I would like to fill in that 10 year gap with a movie that I've written. It's called oh. Chronicles of Mars. And um, some really great people are, are involved. Uh, you know Steve Hansen. He's mm-hmm. one of my favorite creature workers to ever work with. He's just my part, heterosexual life partner. You he's, know? he's nameless, and too. He's nameless. <laughs> he, he's Frankenstein's monster. Yep, he's, a, he's, every, he's yeah, my monster. He's awesome. But yeah. there's a big character called Tars Tarkas, and, and me and Steve. I've had Steve and uh, the rest of the cast weapon training for over a year now to oh, build cool. towards this so they can fight like they know what they're doing. And um, we're going to make an epic Star Wars-esque sci-fi thing for 10 bucks in 10 days. You know, it's going to it's gonna be, oh, we're building awesome. spaceships and, and rideable monsters. And um, it's, it's going to be really cool. That's my dream job, like, since... So I... Forever. I, I wanted to make this idea, like my whole life I love He-Man I lo- I grew up with that world and this would be the closest thing to making a He-Man movie but um, in 20 um, I don't know the date 2007 to 2009 somewhere in there I did a movie called, called Princess of Mars for the Asylum and it starred Tracy Lords and Antonio Sobata Jr. and um, that was the book of, of Princess of Mars that I am obsessed with and we did the closest we could on a two week shoot with $2,500 of a makeup effects budget, which is insane. So I can't believe I just admitted that. <laughs> and um, and we did what we could. But the Tharks, which are the big aliens, they didn't have four arms. They're supposed to have four arms like Goro from uh, Mortal Kombat. Oh, and okay. they, they didn't have that. And we, we did what we could. The story was told very well. It was very accurate. More accurate than the big Disney bullshit John Carter thing that's terrible. Um, and... Uh, but I, ever since then, I've been like, I can make this better. I can do this. I know what I'm doing. And it wasn't, the director, Mark Atkins, was a huge fan. But when you're working for a company like The Asylum, you have to work with what you have. And we did. Um, and I, I just think it can be done better and uh, with more heart and a little bit more. I'm not going to be accurate to the book because I'm making up my own story in this 10-year gap. And uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. So hopefully April, um, uh, May, we're working on uh, securing financing for that. And it's... It'll probably be the one of the bigger budgets we've done, but still at a, less than a craft service budget for a normal movie. Right. You know, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very proud of you. Yeah, I can't wait for that project. That'll be fun. Yeah, a good sci-fi movie. And and in Nevada, <laughs> we have all the weird stuff from Mars, right? Like right. there's so many cool landscapes, the dry riverbed. We're making these spaceships that'll fly across the dry riverbed like land speeders. And, oh, fun! You know, it's a uh, that I sounds love, fun creatively. I love horror movies, but I love movies. So, right. like, we want to make this family-friendly robot boxing movie. We want to make this sci-fi movie. We want to make tons of slasher movies and monster movies. And just keep Plan 10 uh, evolving in, in ways of, like, just bonkers entertainment, you know? Love that. Yeah. Now you can have your own channel one day. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, that seems like a lot to manage. But Yeah, it could be. I'm not I don't sure. Know. I don't know. I don't know what that would entail, but... Sounds like it could happen. (laughs) 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 To hire means you need money. Right? (laughs) Well, I think that wraps up our interview. Awesome. I don't think we have any more questions. Would you like to plug anything else or say anything else about your projects? You know, keep your eyes peeled for Teddy Told Me To. Uh, It's a lot of fun, October 10th. And then uh, 
other than that, just uh, follow Plan 10 Pictures on um, on Instagram, Tom Devlin's Monster Museum on Instagram. Uh, and and for those of you guys who do come out to Vegas, please, Nightmare Cafe, Nightmare Toys, the Monster Museum. There's a lot That's of a fun, fun day. There's a lot of fun things to be done here. Oh, you know? there are. There's tons so, of horror uh, stuff here. It is a... Uh, I feel like we're growing. I think we're so, getting, too. The, the horror community is growing in vegas and it's very cool yeah i think so too there's a there's a lot to do for horror fans here so yeah you you can't you won't come here and be bored (laughs) that's for sure and if you don't like gambling that's fine because there's other things to do besides that so yeah Yeah, was that the uh the giant sphere uh last night was a giant eyeball oh i saw that eyeball was was crazy yeah Yeah. they've done the eyeball they've done it a pumpkin all kinds of fun stuff pac-man's been the best yeah. The Pac-Man? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves it. I heard that it's like getting traffic problems down there now. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's Venetian come end of August is no longer going to be free parking. Yep, no more free parking at the, the Venetian sphere. and Palazzo. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where we would always go park at. We did go to the strip with the Palazzo. That was what. But yeah, no more free parking there. <laughs> Real quick, let's talk about just a few products before we go. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. So we got some uh, more body knockers. Um, I was like, I love this Frankenstein one. Yeah. Frankenstein one is very cool, and the Elvira one is really cool. Yeah, I might have to take one home. Yeah, <laughs> I figured you were going to. <laughs> but then we also did get Coraline. So all of them are available in the store. They're online. Um, and then we still do have the Jigsaw, Reagan, Reagan, and. Annabelle. And these are how much? Uh, sixteen ninety nine. Yeah, cool. So. And then I also brought that because I wanted to show everybody yeah. this too from also, Fun World. It's like uh, they're, they're like uh, banners for yeah, your windows. Yeah, yeah, for your windows or for like the sides of your or wherever you want to hang them, I guess. But you can see on the picture that they're, they're on the sides of the door here. But you get two banners, so that's pretty cool. Hell, mm-hmm. You can just hang them up on your wall. Too. And then we we didn't bring them in, but we do uh, we did get doormats in. Yeah. For the ghost face and then Rob Zombie's Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. And we got some other stuff in too from mm-hmm. Fun World. Some fun Halloween decorations mm-hmm. and things like that too. So all that's online all and in store. And in store. Cool. Um, I think we got what? Midsummer Scream is next weekend. Wow. For already? us. Are you yeah. going? No. No? Yeah, that's next weekend. Yeah. I always, I feel so bad. I love those guys. and It's a good uh, one. I a- just can never pull it it's at the wrong time of the year for me always <laughs> um and uh i did make it one year and it was an amazing time and i love those guys i love everybody that goes down there i see all my friends and uh i just can't i never make it it's uh, one more about the vendors a little bit more yeah they have they have quite a few guests though at this particular one than mm-hmm. they've had before though they it's have a great mix of halloween and horror though. yeah it's yeah. a that's a cool thing it's like it is an actual mix of Halloween yes. and haunted houses and horror movies, which yep. you don't see in, a, in most shows. It's usually no. one or the other. No, it's so much fun. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday next week, and with the 20, 28th, 29th, and 30th. So we'll be there. We'll have a booth. Come mm-hmm. si- say hi to us. Um, and then we have Creep IE Cons in September. Are you doing that one? I've never done that, but I've heard that it is incredible yeah you need to do that uh, one. brett wagner yeah. was telling me how great that it's yeah, very it, well it, organized yeah, it's few fantastic that they've done have been amazing yeah and they've really done two and it's yeah in, this is the it's third in one. september do you know around what time the it 23rd is. and 24th mm-hmm. yeah so that one they only do two days yeah saturday, they only Sunday. do saturday sundays okay well, yeah I'll keep it's it in mind fantastic i don't uh i don't know what the schedule looks like and then, well, they'll do it like this one's the aftermath, and yeah. they'll do another they'll, one. They do one in the beginning of February. Yeah. Okay. See, that's a better time for me. This is a tough month for, uh, like, the the whole, between right now and the end of October is just insane. You got a lot of movie but, stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> Mo- movie stuff and conventions, and I got to travel around with Kane Hodder and do his costume. So he's right. somewhere else every month, you know, and it's like. That is a it's a tough thing. And you did the Jason X costume for yeah. him. In case I've done somebody Jason doesn't know that. Jason X uh, Part Eight, uh, the Friday Thirteenth Part Eight, uh, we just did in in uh, Niagara Falls, and then also wherever we were just at. Oh, Phoenix, Mad Monster. Yeah. And now we're doing Part Seven for the first time in Flashback Ooh. Weekend, August Fourth, <gasps> um, which oh. is going to be awesome. Yeah, that's in Chicago. And, We've done that one once. I love I love Flashback. Weekend. Yeah, it's a great one. But. And the part seven is, uh, of course, sculpted by John Beekler, who's my favorite effects artist. So this is a real personal uh, piece. Kane was, I don't want to say apprehensive, but he had to be 
he had to be proven that that this was gonna be good. And when he saw the pictures, he was like, "Let's do it. We're doing oh, it." That's you know? so good. I just oh. so. Uh, and then hopefully I'm gonna get if I can do Jason goes to hell. I've done all of his. You know. That's awesome, Tom. Yeah. That is so awesome. I love that. Ah, love the community. You have any other questions? I got nothing. All right. Well, I guess next week we are going to do uh, The Flood. We're going to talk about The Flood with Devaney. Um, if you haven't seen our interview with Devaney Penn, we did that, what was it, about a month and a half ago? It should be on our YouTube. Yeah. You can watch that interview. That was a fantastic uh, interview with her. Um, and she's in this movie called The Flood. So we're going to do that next week. Yeah. Which I guess it's still kind of rolling in theaters. Is it? Round. Yeah. Very cool. So it is on video on demand. Um, so. Crocodile in a prison. Yep. Oh Cro- my gosh. Yeah, it's it, it's <laughs> sold. Yeah, it, know, it's right? sold. <laughs> it, it's literally crawl me to sold on precinct thirteen. Done. Right. Yeah. The flood. Yeah. Gotta go. Oh watch my that. gosh. <laughs> I love, I love anything to do with crocodiles and alligators. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, it's it's that's awesome. It's a very wild movie. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, because you already kind of watched. Yeah, it I kind of watched it uh, in pieces. So now I, I have to sit down and watch the entire thing through. But yeah. the pieces I saw were amazing. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm excited about it, too. So we will cover that movie next week, and I guess we will see y'all next week. All right. Bye. Bye.